everybody. I'm Jennifer Simpson. I'm the founder of Talk Story Publishing. Um, we help writers get their stories out into the world. And we're super excited to present Karen Zirk. She's the author of Falling from the Moon, which takes place in the Sierras during Redwood summer in 1990. Um, Karen, Karen has a PhD in mythological studies and depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute. In addition, she has a BA in literature and creative writing from UCSD. In her spare time, <laughs> she's, an, she's an environmental activist. She works mostly on Rose Creek, which is her neighborhood creek that feeds San Diego's Mission Bay. And she is gonna to talk to us about the true price of activism. So welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for joining, especially on short notice. So my, I have a quick question for everybody. Had anybody heard of Judy Berry before today? No, okay, wonderful. Then I get to enlighten everybody. So Judy Berry was born in 1949 and was a fighter and organizer for many labor, social and environmental justice causes. From facilitating anti-war protests against the Vietnam War to union organizing on behalf of workers, Barry's life was dedicated to protecting the common people against the United States government in its quest for power and the major corporations who put profits over people in the planet. In 1979, Barry moved to California where she worked with Pledge of Resistance, a grassroots activist effort aimed at preventing the U.S. invasions of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua during the 1980s. Uh, when she moved up to the north coast of California, she shifted her focus to the rapid destruction of California's redwoods. And in 1988, she teamed up with Daryl Cherney, and they became the organizing team of Earth First in Northern California. Um, Barry is credited with kind of feminizing Earth First. Before then, it was kind of like the Young White Guys Club um, in, in the environmental activist movement, and she brought in a lot of diverse voices. Even then, when she was trying to save the Redwood, she organized lumber mill workers by helping to create local number one of the industrial workers of the world, or the Wobblies. Due to her work at organizing lumber mill workers and fighting the clear cutting of Redwood forests, Barry Cherney and other activists received multiple death threats that law enforcement in the area refused to investigate. In the spring of 1990, Barry and Cherney dreamed up Redwood Summer, modeled after the Mississippi Summer Civil Rights Campaigns of the early 1960s. The goal was to bring thousands of people from around the country to California's North Coast and create a series of nonviolent actions, both symbolic and direct, to bring attention to the plight of the Redwoods. As part of their efforts in getting the word out about Redwood Summer, Barry and Cherney were in the Bay Area uh, visiting college campuses and sharing a video about what they were doing. On May 24th, 1990, they were driving in Oakland, California when a powerful bomb exploded in the car. Barry was almost killed. But while in intensive care, she was placed under arrest, investigated by the FBI for being a terrorist and blamed for transporting bombs. In other words, they arrested her for blowing herself up. She suffered from multiple fractures in her pelvis, her tailbone was pulverized, and she experienced extensive nerve damage crippling her and leaving her with constant pain for the rest of her life. Barry and Cherney eventually filed a civil rights lawsuit against the FBI and the Oakland Police Department for violating their civil rights and for not looking for other 
perpetrators or other suspects who could have planted the bomb, especially when there was a pattern of death threats against both of them. On March 2nd, 1997, Barry died of breast cancer. And the lawsuit continued on. Um, in 2002, the jury awarded $4.4 million to Barry's estate and to Cherney for violation of First and Fourth Amendment rights. I never met Barry, but I did attend some of Redwood's summer's actions. The heart and spirit that were present in saving the Redwoods, feminizing the world of Earth First, and bringing labor and environmental activists together to save 2,000-year-old redwood trees, the teaching of nonviolent direct actions to thousands, all of this continued without her presence because she was in the hospital. My participation in Redwood Summer is with me in many ways, from a com commitment to nonviolence to caring for a small creek in San Diego, Redwood Summer taught me that when we include more voices in the conversation, our achievements will be greater. Redwood Summer was full of excitement, hope for the future, and the belief that united we could save the planet. All goals I still believe in, even if they are happening more slowly than I had anticipated they would when I was in my 20s. The legacy of Redwood Summer is long, even though many people have never heard of Judy Berry or Redwood Summer. Some have argued that the environmental movement was forever changed. The failure of law enforcement to properly investigate the bombings has created a similar mystique as exists around the assassination of President Kennedy. Make no mistake, the attempted assassination on Barry and Cherney has created endless theories and plot terms. Multiple films have been made about it, yet Barry is still not a household name. As to the true cost of activism, as we have seen with many other better known heroes, those with money and power will go to great lengths to stop a more equitable, equitable mode of life. One of the protagonists of my novel is an organizer for Redwood Summer, and we first meet her at the kickoff event, which took place in Samoa, California on June 20th, 1990. Lauren danced with River on the hard packed sand while the funky folk band played on a homemade stage overlooking the ocean. The sky was gray, but a few patches of blue shone through to the east. Overhead, the sun fought to break through the fog, even though it was already past noon. The wind blew in off the ocean. Lauren had dressed lightly with no jewelry in order to be able to move freely when the time came. Dreadlocks tied back so they would stay out of the way. On stage, the band plucked and twanged a slow and mellow haze that floated across the crowd with the wail of the harmonica weaving in and out of the drums. Lauren took on the persona of a blissed out hippie at a Grateful Dead show, swaying and whirling in a fake trance, arms flailing to the invisible light show that her fingers and arms were pretending to catch. River's stiff arms and legs failed to follow the melody or the beat, and Lauren laughed to herself. His wooden dance and echo of the lumber he used to cut at his uncle's sawmill in Louisiana. Every so often he would glance at her and grin, totally clueless about his awful dancing. He tried so hard to be a hippie in his hand-woven, multicolored Guatemalan pants, his black dreadlocks had just started to set after months of twisting them, and even his beard had started to dread a bit. He was looking the part. But he came from a logging family, and Lauren fretted that he would return to his family and marry a local church-going woman who wanted five children. As Lauren twirled, she peeked to the other side of the highway 
to see what was happening. A row of maybe 15 police officers stood casually in front of the lumber company offices. The band ended the current song with a clang, crash, bang of the drums and then started up the simple chords of Dylan's Tangled Up in Blue. Lauren's stomach twitched and rippled. Excitement sparked in her heart. Her mind repeated the mantra, Great Red Woods, as she swayed to the melancholy song. River slowed his dancing, moving side to side, just swinging his arms aimlessly. He mouthed, Great Red Woods. Lauren glanced across the highway at the police in the low-slung building, weathered by the constant wind off the ocean. Corpses of the ancient redwoods surrounded it, victims of the current genocide on old growth and the life forms these once majestic trees had supported. The music swelled, the thunderous drums consuming all, and then bam, the instruments grew silent. The vocalist sang, I got a gig in the great red woods. River grabbed Lauren's hand and half dragged her along after him with the roar of the ocean overshadowing their voices and their feet slapping on the asphalt highway. A tall man bumped into her and River's hand slipped from her grasp. Lauren fell sideways and someone else grabbed her, which was enough to keep her on her feet. She kept running. River disappeared into the crowd. Then the pace slowed with the crowd packed in tight and Lauren wedged herself into the throng. After a brief pause, a small opening formed and she wiggled through it, indomitable. Her body tingled. She felt strong enough to leap over the damn lumber company and land in the bay beyond. She inhaled the punch and blood of the redwoods, which mingled with the salty spray from the breaking waves until she could taste it. She wasn't sure where she was going. The crowd had become one ponderous prehistoric animal moving together and all she could see were the heads and shirts in front of her. Then they were at the entrance to the mill. The crowd spread sideways and the police had disappeared. Someone handed Lauren a sign and she held the wooden handle and bounced the sign up and down while singing along with hundreds of others. Red woods and spotted owls, humans and salmon, together we stand, divided we fall. She looped her arms through those on either side of her, gripping the sign steadily now that its face materialized. Meanwhile, a huge line formed across the front of the transfer station where these majestic trees would be shipped overseas to some country that had already decimated its own forests. A logging truck littered with the murdered bodies of giant redwoods swooshed and hissed to a halt on the highway. The truck was two or three times wider than she was tall. People swarmed onto the truck, monkey people going to their trees, climbing up the sides. The police circled around the truck, batons up, helmets on. Lauren dropped her sign and bolted for the back of the truck. She slipped between the police as they tried to form their barrier. She stretched her arm towards a raven-haired young woman perched on a log with her left arm through the logging chain who pulled her up. They gripped each other and Lauren leveraged the help to pull herself up onto the truck. She grabbed onto a metal lip and pushed herself up to the higher logs. The acidic blood of dead trees clogged up her nose. Her heart drummed a thump womp in her head. In the bright blue ocean, marshmallow waves broke along the peninsula. The band looked small and only a few people remained in front of the stage. Below her, the police struggled to grab the people scrambling up the truck. A couple of officers grabbed a red-headed dreadlock guy by the legs. They dragged him off and let him plunge to the road 
where he bounced when he landed on the asphalt. The cops flipped him over and handcuffed him. Lauren crawled up one more log until she sat on the top of the heap, surrounded by the activists she had been working with for the last few months. Pumped, she high-fived the woman closest to her. The music drifted across the highway like gusts of wind coming off the ocean and the whitewater salt spray coupled with the redwood smell reminded Lauren of the morning she and River had spent entangled in a tent at Gold Bluff's beach, naked and sweaty. Outside their tent, Roosevelt elk snuffled through the bushes, their gentle footsteps tiptoeing around like voyeurs trying to avoid detection. One beautiful moment gone wrong. Sarah pointed to the side, Lauren turned around and saw a wall of police advancing on the truck. Their numbers had tripled since the action started. 30 minutes, maybe an hour ago, she had no idea. Voices started to chant, Earth first, profits last. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Karen. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you are. Um, so I was gonna open. I'm gonna. I'm gonna open up the floor to questions. If anyone has any questions, I would welcome them. I had a couple myself, so if you're feeling shy, that's okay. I'll take your questions on chat. And Sandra. And a, a question on chat and, and I can ask it too I just didn't know how we were gonna do this yeah. so what would you prefer either way is fine okay so I'll ask my first one how did you see Barry's presence coming through in the book yeah. very good well since I didn't know Barry and by the time I got involved in Redwood summer the bombing had already taken place I positioned one of my protagonists as an organizer for this event, trying to carry on the vision that had been created. And while the entire novel is not set on the North Coast during the actions, we start there. And then as Lauren, Lauren's journey unfolds throughout the book, the, her friends that she knows through Redwood Summer and her focus on getting back to Redwood Summer are woven throughout the book. And to me, it's a way of, you know, as, as we've been hearing from the Black Lives Matter movement say their name, you know, and people don't know about Redwood Summer. They don't know who Judy Berry is. And, she effectively gave her life to save redwood trees, and I think that makes her a hero of the First Order. Yeah, undoubtedly. I was just wondering how, other than your constant knowledge of her and your feeling her presence, how she came alive for you in the book. So, um, You mentioned that the bombing's still not solved, but were there any theories on where the death threats were coming from, like loggers? corporations, the FBI itself? I think the, the most commonly held theory is that the threats were coming from the timber companies okay. um, because what had happened was there had been a small local company that owned a lot of land up there and was logging at a sustainable pace, but then they were bought out in a hostile takeover that leveraged a bunch of junk bonds to fund the purchase. And so the theory was that the log, the pace of logging had increased substantially so they could pay off the debt of this hostile takeover. And because Barry and Cherney were the most um, prominent voices in this movement, you know, they had received death threats. They even 
a year earlier, uh, Judy and her two children had been driving in a car and was run over, her car was run into by a logging truck. So if you're driving in a little Toyota Corolla and one of those big logging semi trucks runs into you, that does serious damage. And the police just treated it as an accident, a traffic accident, not as an attempt to silence her. And the interesting part about that is that same driver and that same logging truck had been stalled a few days earlier by the protesters, you know, trying to prevent the logging from happening. So it's a little suspicious to me that the same logger and logging truck that accidentally ran into Judy was also part of a direct action protest a few days earlier. But the police just refused to treat any of these attempts on her life as anything other than accidents or not serious, you know, the death threats weren't considered serious. And then when the bomb finally went off in her car, neither the FBI nor the Oakland police looked into any of this other information that had been provided to them. And they just made Barry and Cherney their suspects and said they were transporting bombs themselves and it blew up and so they were guilty and did not consider any other angles in the investigation at all. So, you know, by the time the lawsuit worked out, you know, we're 20 or 12 years later, um, you know, it's really hard to start an investigation into a bombing 12 years later. So speaking of that, knowing that um, they won the lawsuit, where did that money go? I mean, well, no went to her foundation or her estate, but what did they do with the money? That I do not know. I do not know. I know that Cherney has made another movie about the whole situation, one of the many movies that, or documentaries that have been made. Um, I'm not sure if he used his share of the money for that or not. When Barry died, she left behind two teenagers. So I'm sure uh, some of the money <laughs> went to college educations. And Yeah, I, I just thought it would be ironic if it went to fund the environmental activism even yeah. more. Yeah. It would, ser so it would serve them right. And also knowing that you did go to some actions at that time, how much of that did you draw upon to create that scene? Oh, a lot of it. I was, was not at the action in Samoa, but I was at a few of the other actions that happened in the summer. And due to the timing of the novel, I needed to focus on that first action so I basically took all my personal experiences, then read some firsthand accounts of how that action went down and blended all that into Lauren's experience. Mm. So what about some of the songs and chants? Were those real ones or did you make them up yourself? I made them up myself. I honestly don't remember the actual chants and the Dylan song, Tangled Up in Blue, has this great line about the great north woods. Mm. And due to copyright laws, you can't quote any piece of a song. Yeah. But I thought I can reference the name of the song, and then it's more appropriate that the lyrics just be changed to the great red woods for the context in which this story is taking place. Unfortunately, I can't sing like Dylan. Well, I, I don't know. Dylan is not really known for singing, per se. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great songwriter, for sure, and musician. Um, so my, oh, I, I just, I just wanted to say I really love this idea of really humanizing the trees and talking about them as dead bodies, and I thought that was really. It worked really well. And I just, I mean, I, 
I guess I really listened this time. I've read the scene and I've known you, of course. And just hearing that scene again, it just really, the smells, he, he had such great images that I thought it really worked well. Thank so, you. So good job. Yeah. I have another question. What do you think drove Barry? I mean, there, there's, it takes a certain level of commitment to live through death threats, especially if you've got running around in a little car with two kids, stuff like that. So, and I understand that threats to the earth are serious, and yet, given everything that was going on, this was like a step beyond. So what do you think drove her to this level of commitment? I think it was a, a kind of a building of commitment. She started out in college organizing protests against the Vietnam War, then got involved with, you know, the U.S., atrocities in Central America. And so I think as her, her level of participation increased, her level of awareness increased. And I honestly don't think that she really thought she would be bombed. I, I mean, I just, you know, it's like you hear things. I mean, I've had death threats from things that I've been involved with as well. And, you know, makes you uncomfortable, but then you kind of take it with a grain of salt. But she kept putting herself out there and just, I don't even think she realized how much of a risk she was in. And even though she did die of breast cancer, you know, my personal hunch seems, tells me that somehow that was involved with all the injuries she sustained in the bombing. Because when your body is so destroyed and so mangled and now you have cancer, it's almost like, how do you even notice that amongst all the other things? And by the time mm -hmm. it was discovered, you know, it had mastitized, metastasized, Jennifer. Metastasized. Hill. Metastasized. You know, and, and I think that's really just because everything else in her body was so destroyed. So when you have 10 parts of your body screaming in pain all the time, how do you notice one little lump in your breast? Good point. <laughs> also, treatments have gotten much better. Definitely, definitely true. Um, as you well know. Yeah, so it kind of makes you wonder, like, or just think about, at least it does for me, like, what are you willing to put your life on the line for? And how sometimes what you're doing, you don't perceive as putting your life on the line for until it's almost too late, or it's just the circumstances created, you know, it's, I don't think it's always an intentional choice. And I'm not saying that it wasn't for Barry to do what she had to do to save the Redwoods. But I know for myself, I've been in some pretty hairy situations and a lot of them, I had no intention of being in. They just happen and you deal with it the best you can. Well, on that note, thank you, Karen. Um, I think Judy Berry definitely should be more known, as many, many women should be more known. Accordingly, it looks like only old white men had anything to do with the building of this country. So, <laughs> and we know that's not true, but we don't get educated enough. So thanks for educating us on, on this particular aspect of our country and uh, you can find out more about Karen at karenzerk.com and you can find out more about the book on fallingfromthemoon.com. You can buy it from your local independent bookstore on bookshop.org or at the publisher's website talkstorypublishing.com or at Karen's website it's available lots of places. So do check it out. And uh, thanks so much for coming, you guys. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>